Um, I actually have a day job, everybody. <laughs> I took the day off from work today to be here today and do all my advocacy and rescue work in my personal time. And in my day job, I had the pleasure of hearing Patty speak. And she was actually speaking to CEOs all over the world about endurance and resilience as a leader. And I was like, gosh, so much of this is resonating with me as an advocate. And I reached out to her to see if she'd be interested in talking with all of you today about the importance of self-care from an advocate's perspective so that we can continue um, to be strong, resilient, and have that endurance to continue to be a voice for wolves and, and all the things that we're passionate about, truly. And it just really moved me. And I know, um, you know, this morning we heard from the states that are really getting hit the hardest. You know, the deck is stacked, no doubt about it. And uh, it just does my heart so good. It, it, it hurts and, and jumps for joy at the same time when I see folks like Kim Bean and, and Casey York and, and Montana and everyone from the Northern Rockies diving in, knowing full well the outcome has already been predetermined and they're up and at it the very next day doing it all over again. So um, Patty, welcome. Um, you. you have an amazing background, an amazing story yourself and please consider this an interactive session with the three of us. And we can also drop some questions in the chat for people, um, but I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Okay, thank you so much. Now I'd love to be this to be as interactive because if I'm not going and addressing something that somebody would love for me to talk about, um, as Betsy knows, um, I'm very flexible during our discussions. So do not uh, hesitate to interrupt the flow because I wanna make this most useful to everybody. So anyway, um, it really is a pleasure to talk with all of you today. Um, and I don't say that casually because I know we go all, we all go to conferences and the speaker says, oh, it's my pleasure to talk with you. Um, but I have to share with you that the more I learned about this cause and the work of activism, which is a world I really haven't um, dove into before. And the more I heard about that from Betsy and we talked through about what it was, the more humbled I was that, um, you asked me, Betsy, to be part of your conference because I was struck by the incredible commitment and dedication to such a worthy cause. And equally as important, it really hit home the incredible challenges and pressure you face as activists, a little bit that I've heard from, I've been bopping in and out, you know, kind of listening in as I could. You know, and when you think about what you're doing now, and especially in today's much more difficult and very charged world, so if there's a group of people that I thought I could help support, it's this one. So thank you very much. So resilience um, is, as you heard from Betsy, you know, I give a lot of talks about resilience. Um, it's long been a core aspect of my professional work. I work with um, hospital systems and healthcare professionals where burnout is really rampant and, um, and especially now. And my work is centered on bringing tools and frameworks and resources from other high performance cultures like you know, US military special, Oper Force, uh, special operations forces, CIA, Central Intelligence Agency, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second, elite sports and the performing arts. Um, and the whole intent is to help healthcare workers improve their resilience during a time, you know, this is basically their war um, I hate using such terminology, but it, that's probably how it feels like day in and day out. So the second thing is, um, I also, as Betsy mentioned, work with a lot of uh, um, CEOs and executives in a wide variety of industries. And I focus with them on how to build their personal strategies for resilience and performance under pressure. And I'll talk about that linkage a little bit because they're the ones leading their companies in these very difficult times and their people but I also see it from a national security standpoint. I look at this, this is what's gonna help pull our economy out of its slump. So you can probably see there's a theme here. Uh, my work is centered on supporting those who support us in our future. And so I come by all of this um, expertise very personally because I've been motivated by service my whole entire life. I joined the Central Intelligence Agency um, when I was 19 years old. I thought I would stay five years and I end up staying uh, 32. The last 10 years of my career, I was part of the executive leadership team, the um, 18 leaders who um, run the agency and its mission. Uh, someplace I'd never thought I would be, but I was very humbled to, you know, to be able to serve at that level. But my work with resilience actually even started earlier than that 
um, earlier in my career at CIA because my substantive background is counterterrorism. And so you can imagine, um, I, I had a very um, eventful and intense career, especially after the United States was attacked by Al Qaeda on September 11th, 2001. And so that's where I'm gonna kind of ground my remarks. But what I'd like everybody to be listening for is what I talk about, how does it apply to you? Because I see, and I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more, but there's so many interactions and overlaps between the world of activism as I dove into it and the world of national security um, in terms of your job is so much more than a day job, no matter what role you are. I mean, you have long days where you are doing your day job as Bessie just said, and then you're doing your activist work. You're championing a cause that's not always well received and that there's peril in that. There's also that emotional toll of wanting to, you know, to save something, to be committed to something where you know people and animals are counting on you, that takes a lot. And I can remember feeling so many of those things when I was working in war zones and you know working you know long nights. And I just remember that's so that's why it's like this is, this is a group of people that I can relate to. Before I dive any deeper, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page about resilience. I'm using the definition of resilience from the American Psychological Association because it defines it so well as the process of adapting in the face of adversity, trauma, threats, or significant stress. And it includes, and it goes on to say, it's not only the process of adapting, but it's those practices that, pe that help people to not only recover from these challenging times, but also to facilitate their growth and development. So I'd love for everybody to be thinking as I'm talking about four words, adapt, recover, grow, and develop, uh, which to, for me define the human capacity to perform under pressure, and which is essentially the outcome of resiliency. So it's more than just bouncing back or mental toughness or grit or fortitude, because those are terms that really are talking about powering through something. They're not really, and resilience is so much more than that. Resilience is actually thriving in some of that. I'm not glorifying stress and I'm not glorifying tough times, but I'm saying you're, you know, people who can get through that with some degree of energy and focus and um, confidence, that's resilience and it's different. So after the um, terrorist attacks um, against the United States in 2001, um, I essentially work seven days a week, often 14 to 16 hours a day for about seven years to include serving in a high threat environment overseas for a number of years. And I was able to survive and even thrive during this time because of three conditions. The first one was my ability to manage my stress and my mindset which I did by taking care of myself to the uh, extent I could. I don't know if people are familiar with TRXs. It's a Navy SEAL suspension system, but it allows you to work out no matter where you are. My uh, TRX goes with me everywhere I go because even when I just only have time to stretch, it's wonderful. Um, and I also tried to make sure that I wasn't always drinking junk food, I mean, eating junk food or you know, over drinking in the evenings You know, when you're trying to decompress. That's what self-care is all about. And that's what, you know, managing your stress is making sure you're taking care of those things and not falling into bad habits. And I also developed some other coping strategies that allowed me to navigate with some degree of calm and a lot of positivity and energy, which is what it takes to get through all of this. Number two, the great teams that I was privileged to lead um, or to be a part of, because we took deliberate care and I think that's all of you, like when you show up in different places, we took deliberate care to kind of get to know one another, uh, figure out how to leverage each other's strengths um, and expertise and how best to work together. I was leading teams during this time of people who had never met me and had never met each other. We were thrown together because of circumstance. We were plopped into war zones or we're starting up new capabilities and we needed to be at our best and as quickly as we could. The third thing was that motivating feeling of being part of something bigger than myself. That of what I was trying to do was to protect the United States against further attack and figure out who was attacking us so that we could send the military or you know, special forces against that people to, you know, so that they could not attack us again. And so it's that sense of belonging 
it's that common purpose with others. It's feeling that your contribution mattered and that I had value added. And these are all very fundamental human drivers. But those were the three things that really got me through those seven years. I can't say it was a joy and a privilege to work like that. And I'm not, I'm not going to say that I was an example of, you know, inspirational leadership 100% of the time. But the consistency of my overall experience during this time gave me the resilience I needed to put up with it, to achieve, to contribute, and to thrive. Because it also gave me the resilience to, that launched me into the executive ranks of the CIA. Because in crisis, I found my leadership style. I was a little bit of a late bloomer, um, hadn't really distinguished myself previous to that um, in any way that somebody would have said, oh, she's going to be leading one day. But it was during this time and it was during working with these people for this cause at that moment that really, you know, unleashed my ability to help shape and support high performing teams. And that's the grow and develop part of resilience. So I'm going to focus on this part um, for the remainder of my remarks, um, which is the individual side of resilience. You know, as I said earlier, there are such tremendous parallels between your world and the one I left not too long ago that I think that some of this will resonate with you, you know, especially when you know, Betsy and I, you were talking about what I could talk, um, talk to. So the research on resilience really does reinforce that some of these coping mechanisms that I talked about and these strategies that I developed or refined during my high time of, um, my time of high and enduring stress. And these are ones that from my work in high performance, um, which I do on the healthcare side and working with all of these other people, is that you will find these elements in all high performing cultures. Uh, they are endemic and it's what keeps them working and um, operating at that level. And when you do get into it, there's four foundational pillars to building resiliency uh, that I think will be useful to you. And I also believe, and I, from my own experience and my coaching work, it can be self-taught and it can be cultivated in others. Each one of you was sent, everybody was sent the worksheet, right, uh, Betsy? Yes, I dropped the link in the chat here and it will be in the post event email and it was in the pre event email as well. So um, it is just a simple worksheet so that you can grab from what you think is most relevant from our time together here. And it also includes a little self assessment um, because I want you to, to look to think of yourself against these and evaluate yourself against these four pillars one to five. One being, I haven't really thought about this very much. I don't pay a whole lot of attention. I'm not intentional. To five is, no, these are eyes of very strong um, thoughts and practices in these areas that I feel like I've really mastered them. It's the reason why I'm gonna ask you to do that is because some of these tools and techniques that I give you and share with you, um, the ones that I stole from others, and I'll tell you where I got them, um, you may find some of them more useful than others. Um, and so that's, so it knows where you wanna probably plug them into um, the work, worksheet. So um, the first one of the four is self-care. And these are the habits, the practices and rituals that help you recover, reset, manage your energy. And what I like to call is, you know, managing your surge capability that when you need that something extra that extra energy, that extra burst of adrenaline, that you've got something in your tank in order to be able to respond to the moment, whether it is to take advantage of an opportunity because not all stress is bad, or is it to kind of modulate yourself and say, oh, I need to pull back. This is different than self-nurturing, which self-nurturing is that extra glass of wine that I might've mentioned earlier, or that piece of dessert, or in my case, a piece of pizza that I know I'm not supposed to have. Um, so that is you know, where you just want comfort. And so that's a separate category than self-care. So on a scale of one to five, um, I'd love you to take just a couple seconds and say, on thinking about self-care for myself, and especially during stress, stressful times, I'm either at a one where it's the, I'm the last person I think of to five, it is, I put myself first, like, you know, you are in that airplane put your mask on and then help the person next to you. 
You want okay. them to put it, you want people to put it in the chat yeah. what they think people they want are. To put it in the chat. I'd just be curious where this comes up. Yeah, I got a five. Yes, I love that. Oh, I like that. Self-care is sometimes a dog or a wolf kiss. And we're going to be talking about that here coming up. For consistency, I like this. Okay. Oh, this is really, we're having a wide variance between people who really do pay attention to this and others where I'm hoping that you'll come away and you'll realize just how important self-care is and to kind of top, you know, move it up your priority list because it really is what's gonna give you that foundational energy for whatever you have to uh, feel. Oh, Steve is a four. <laughs> of course, naturally. <laughs> yeah. So according to the research, uh, thank you everybody who has been, uh, oh, I like this, fur first. <laughs> That's great. Um, so according to the research, people are three and a half times more likely to be resilient when you're in good health. And in other words, Health, your health has a really powerful impact on our ability to survive and thrive under pressure. And this means paying attention to how do you fuel your body? Do you take time to make sure you're getting enough protein? You're moderating your fats and your sugars and your refined products. You're doing what you need to, to give you energy, which is where your protein, nice balanced diet. These things are important. And I'm not talking about being pristine because obviously from my remarks earlier, I'm not. But we do, my husband and I really do pay attention in this area. And especially when we were serving overseas um, in high stress environments. The second part of this is of your health is really paying attention to making the most of whatever sleep you can get. Not, you know, I know everybody says eight hours. We cannot always get eight hours, but make the most of what sleep you can, what rituals make sure that you can get to sleep at a decent enough time you're waking up roughly around the same time. Um, you have a darkened room. You meditate before bed. You have a uh, morning ritual that helps wake you up. These things are really important to managing energy. The third thing is intentional recovery time, which is like you heard me, I work out wherever I can. Um, and this is the getting outside piece. This is whatever movement you can put into your day. Movement is so important. Sitting too long, being stressed, really focusing too long is not healthy. I will tell you, most people's creative ideas do not come when they're in front of the computer. It's when they off, they're going off and doing something else. And so the last point is that self-care really is all about play too. So for those of you who have dogs, um, you know, who mentioned that in the chat, I think it's great. It's not just for kids. Play makes us happy. Um, animals make us happy. Um, so it's a key to reset because we let go of work. And I stole this from a book called Time, or somebody said wolf dogs, that's right. Um, I stole this idea from a, a book called Time Off, which posits that rest is just as important, not just to recover from work, but it's your work ethic is, your rest ethic should be more important than your work ethic. Because it involves us, it's something we get absorbed in, it soothes our mind, and it frees our body of whatever stress it's under. So, um, so that's, so that's self-care. Anybody have any comments or something that they would like to add to this on self-care for the, especially those of you at the four and five level? I'll, I'll start. Um, it's amazing how it doesn't have to be this huge epic thing that you need to work into your life. I have set the goal that Saturday morning is sacred to me and I go and do yoga. Mm -hmm. And no matter what's going on or how many requests I get, I do not deviate from that schedule because it is the only thing that keeps me yeah. uh, sane. 9 to 11 a.m. every Saturday morning. So I just want to say it doesn't take much, actually, yeah. to create that reset. Yep, I would agree with you fully. That's a great one. Okay, first pull up pillar, self-care. Ah, here's somebody said, I take my dog for two to three mile hikes. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure she reminds you it's time to go. Um, and if they're like my dog, he actually will get, go get the leash. Um, so number two, the pillar is self-awareness. 
This is, yes, all about understanding who you are, that realistic assessment of your strengths, your weaknesses, your impact on others, which really is the foundational well being for um, underpinning for well being, satisfaction, and growth. So, self awareness, which I personally think is the number one um, skill for success in anything. But I'd love to hear where people are on one to five. And where would you say, how are you about your self awareness along those lines, your strengths? your weaknesses, your impacts on others. One being, hmm, I don't think about it very much, or five going, you know, I'm very empathetic, you know, and very attuned to people in the room. I got a four, that's great. Lots of fours. Oh my gosh, I wish you people had all been working with me way back when, <laughs> when I was working overseas. This is great. I'm glad to see this. So you'll be able to probably add some practices into the chat too when I'm talking about this. Because for resilience, self-awareness is all of those things, but it's also very intentionally um, that critical part of understanding, which is understanding your emotions. A lot of time people don't realize our emotions are really what we're thinking and it's a hard time to figure that out, but our emotions also trigger our stress. And so it's really paying attention to what are those stress triggers as part of your self-awareness, those, phys those physical and cognitive cues that you're under stress. Not all stress is bad. Um, so I want you to say that you know, appropriate stress can spur you further, as I mentioned earlier, cognitively and physically beyond what we all previously thought we were capable of. But all stress all the time with no leaf relief leads to burnout which is increasingly prevalent, especially during the pandemic. And then for those who are very actively involved in whatever they're doing, your cause, healthcare, policing, everything, all come, you will see an awful lot is we, the bad behavior that we're seeing is attributed to burnout. So from one of my um, colleagues, the legendary Andy Walsh, who you should all look up because he's a very cool guy, um, he uh, is the former head of Red Bull's um, high performance lab. He is also um, the person who really propelled the Olympic US C ski team onto the uh, international um, podiums. Um, just amazing. And he teaches about this whole idea of understanding your tr uh, stress triggers. He works with his athletes and now a lot of his clients to say, start figuring out what is your stress curve? and kind of figure out where are you on your stress curve so you can figure out how to modulate your stress uh, before it impacts your ability to respond well or it robs you of an opportunity because you lack the energy to take advantage of it. So his view is if you can name your stress, you can tame it. And so he teaches that the way you do that is so to develop that stress pattern recognition that you're looking for and what your own stress curve is Every time you find yourselves feeling stressed, write it down in a little, on a piece of paper, in a notebook or something that basically says, today, this were the times I got stressed. These were the, what was happening when I got stressed and this was my response. And it starts giving you that awareness of, you know, what triggers you because that's the first step to starting your um, stress mitigation plan. And the awareness of your stress patterns leads you to another self-awareness component for resilience, which is knowing when your energy is completed. Being able to discern when you are overextended, what are your signs and symptoms? Um, I have a spiral of negative thinking. And when I start doubting myself, that's when I know that I'm starting to get really low on resilience and I'm very stressed. Um, other people get irritable, other people procrastinate on things, they don't want to deal with things, or they have this, you know, this constant feeling of being overwhelmed. This is all really good knowing, because when you understand where you are being overextended and by what, the next piece of this is learning how to set those boundaries. Um, and what I'm talking about is that, you know, learning how to say no um, in a way that you are comfortable with because and that others can hear and respect. And for those people who have a strong degree of service, it is really hard to do that because you're thinking of the people who count on you. You're thinking of the cause that you are you know, championing. It, that, that guilt feeling, that feeling that you're letting somebody down come, pops up. 
This is so key, setting those boundaries to knowing that when you're not going to show up as your best. My husband is a master at this. Uh, he's known as a leader who never says no, but I will tell you, he is great at building on your ideas. And the next thing you know, he's redirected you into another channel that he thinks is better. And you're excited about it, but he never said no. Um, so it's some things to think about, you know, and everybody teases him about his inability to say mm, mm, the no word. So anyway, so anybody have anything else that you want to add to? Um, I hear, you know, spending as a passionate wolf advocate and RN. Oh, how wonderful. I spend quality time with my two fur babies and visit my favorite wolves, wolves at a wolf, wolf preserve. I think that's wonderful. Looking for those areas that really re-energize you. <laughs> Somebody says, I'm always stressed out. I, we can help you with this <laughs> and figuring this out. Okay, so we've gone through two pillars. Uh, we've gone through this, uh, um, we've gone, what do I do? Self-awareness and self-care. And now I'm gonna get to self-talk. Self-talk is the third um, pillar, and it's really what I call it self-talk, but it's really about managing your mindset, and it's what I call cognitive resilience, which I actually teach to my coaching clients. I was able to endure and thrive after 9-11 and now through COVID because I really strive to wake up every morning with positive intent, and it's my little mantra is, okay, what's the luck I need to create today? And when I say luck, it's because I don't expect to have all the answers. It, it relieves me of, you know, incredible burdens, but it's like, okay, what can I create today that's going to get me further than where I was yesterday? And I find that extremely motivated, even when I'm feeling stressed or a little overwhelmed. It was also my leadership habit. And now it's my life habit of what I told you before is that I recognize I'm running low on resilience. When I start self-sabotaging with negative thoughts or doubting myself. And so I have a mantra that I use because now I recognize that I'm doing it. And the first thing I do is I'll take a deep breath and it's a very intentional breath. And I'm going to teach you that breathing strategy um, at the end. But I find, I make myself think to myself, what's the opportunity I'm missing? And as soon as I say, what is that opportunity? All of a sudden my mind shifts and I'm like, okay, I'm now looking for something that I can impact. Even if it's the smallest amount of whatever I can do in the shortest period of time to move something forward, it'll make me feel better. So there, uh, that's an element of self-talk. And I realized somebody, um, somebody actually said something in the chat, but I forgot to ask you on a scale of one to five, where would you put yourself on this whole idea of being able to manage your mindset or your cognitive resilience. One, I'm kind of ruled by it. Five, I have greater mastery over it. Okay, I've got a couple twos and threes. Yeah, this is a little harder one. I'm gonna give you another resource. You know, in addition to having the, um, you know, your mantras or your concepts and your sayings. There are things that um, there's a great book out there called Positive Intelligence, and it's by uh, Stanford psychologist Shirzad Shamin, who's also founded one of the largest uh, leadership coaching schools um, in the world. He's pretty amazing. The Positive Intelligence, I think he also has a TED Talk, but he takes you through how to develop the habit of when you're realizing you're self-sabotaging with thoughts that are not helpful to you or help or ruling your emotions, how you can switch into a much more positive frame of mind. It's actually brilliant. And if you actually, if you do the work, I can't say I'm a Jedi master at this now. I've only been doing it for about nine months, but it really has been extremely helpful during this time to keep me on a more even keel. So, the last, uh, oh, thank you, Betsy, for putting those. Uh, by the way, everybody's putting, Betsy's putting all of these links um, into the chat so that you can pull them out for when you want to use them. Thank you. So the last of the four pillars is staying connected. And that is, to me, um, probably right next to self-care, that's the next and most important one because it, all the others really kind of build off of those two. So 
staying connected, that means with your people, your teams, your networks, your families, and your friends. The research is really compelling, even for us introverts in the room. Um, resilience is a collective capability, and it's heavily enabled by strong relationships and networks. When you reach out and you touch somebody, when you just send somebody a chat to say hi, um, when you do things like you're doing today, being part of this conference, and I can see all of you saying, hey, here's my email. I would love for you to keep in touch. That's what I'm talking about. There's a great Harvard Business Review article out there, and Betsy, I forgot to include it. I will send it to you um, on how we become more resilient through the process of connecting with others. I also like it because it has, again, a little diagnostic with it that allows you to self-assess your own staying connected network and where you may want to think about developing your network a little bit more for those times that you may need. Like you find yourself in another town because you're advocating or you're attending an event. Who do you know there type of thing through the net, through this network. I've always loved the phrase, which I adopted as one of my leadership maxims. But if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I figure that's probably going to resonate with many of you because wolves are pack animals. And so I think that, you know, that to me is what helped me get through all of this. So Four pillars. I hope you heard some things that you can um, kind of bring into your own resilient strategies or start if you want to do. Um, oh, this is somebody good. Sorry, I'm just interrupting myself. Does being connected mean only with humans? Um, no, actually, it doesn't. I think most of us think of those human connections because that's where you can have that interaction. That's where you can, you know, um, engage in discussion and exchange of ideas and find that emotional support. But animals can do that too, or others. If you're feeling that connection with somebody, whether it's emotional, spiritual, you know, that physical, I can hold your hand, that is equally um, can really help you with this piece of resilience. It's where you find it. And you know, what I'm just saying is, please do not you know, uh, forget about this piece. If you find yourself withdrawing, that's probably a sign that you need to reach out um, even more that you're under stress. So what I would hope you would come away with is that the bottom line for developing resilience is that the more you understand yourself and the more that you think about the tools and strategies that you can bring into your life, you know, as Betsy said, they don't have to be huge, big programs. They can be those small things. You know, um, the one thing that really um, you, you, it brought to mind, Betsy, when you said, you know, that two hours, when I was working in a war zone, um, you know, we, when we could, we had something called sleep in Sunday. And for two hours on Sunday morning, that was your time to yourself. Um, and we were living in Quonset huts and, you know, really close quarters and people were always around you, but that two hours felt like a gift. It felt like a mini vacation. So it doesn't have to be much but it can be so rejuvenating. And so, and these are the tools and the strategies like creating the self-talk ma uh, mantra, employing, uh, mantra, employing sleep and morning rituals that really will help you manage your stress, but even more important, your recovery, your energy and your mindset. And this is what's gonna give you the resilience reserves. Do I have a few more minutes? Can I take them through the breathing? Okay, so I'm gonna take you through my favorite breathing exercise. Um, I, at this point, I can do this walking, standing, lying down. Um, I will, if I'm stressed and I'm heading to a meeting, I will do this walking down a hall. Um, and it is um, a breathing message, method called box breathing. And this is something that I was taught by the Navy SEALs um, in a war zone. Um, to kind of kind of control your thoughts. It also, when you build this habit, it, you can actually start controlling your heartbeat and kind of calm your physiological system down so that you can choose your response rather than just react to external stimuli, which for a Navy SEAL and some of these environments is absolutely critical to their survival. So what I'd like everybody to do is put, you know, your feet on the floor. I'd like you to put your hands on your lap and close your eyes. 
And I, what I want you to do is I want you to take a deep breath in and take a deep breath out. And I want to hear that exhale. And I want to breathe in and then breathe out with a lot of force. Do that one more time on your own and then I'm gonna take you through a cadence of breathing. All right, as you breathe in, I want you to breathe in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, Breathe out slowly, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Breathe in, two, three, four. And hold, two, three, four. Breathe out, two, three, four. And hold, two, three, four. I'd like you to do that one more time on your own. Hold, breathe out, and hold. So you can open your eyes and start breathing normally. But I'm hoping you could start feeling, because it's not, it's not easy that first couple times to hold your breath right after you breathe in, you know, you breathe in and then you breathe all the way out. But that's the piece that's most critical. And that's where you focus. Because if you're going to find your mind wandering, it's during those periods. But if you do that for four minutes, four times a day, for four months straight, you're gonna be developing a new habit like I have. And it's something, because it's that, what I just said, that power of fours, that is what's clinically proven in order to be able to adopt a new habit and start. And because when you, when you have a habit, your habit then becomes your default. And it's something you automatically default to matters of stress or when you need to think. This is my go-to. So I hope you found this helpful. I'd love to hear your thoughts and insights on resilience and anything that you want to share or you think that people would find useful or you want to dive a little deeper into anything that I've talked about. But thank you so much. Patty, as usual, I learn something new every single time. I love it. Um, you know, I, I'm looking at a comment here about, you know, how do you sleep? We're in this instance, probably calm the mind when obviously we have a lot of really terrifying, horrible images in our head. And uh, I'm not going to lie, there's many nights I've gone to bed crying because did I do something today to even make any dent or change in that when you hear even more wolves, you know, are killed in horrible ways? Could that breathing, or is there other things that we could just try to remember to help us not internalize that so much, if that's possible? I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, actually I do. Yeah. Uh, working in war zones and counterterrorism, yeah, you see some pretty much. awful things. Yeah. And the breathing really does help because it does make me, you know, move my mind from and shift my mind from that, there's no way to clear your minds. Staying connected. I use the um, meditation app, Calm. I love it. And I've been using it. I've been using the previous versions of that, which I've long have since forgotten what they were. But I have found that some sort of meditation practice. Um, I also find that um, when I am feeling that, or I'm thinking these things and I need to break that pattern, something tactile, uh, this is another habit that, um, a Navy SEAL taught me <laughs> so, and he will sit there and he'll, this is how he interrupts his thoughts. And then he gets his, into his breathing and then he goes, the bottom line is find what works for you. The, um, Shirzad Shamin's book is really brilliant at this talking to people really engaging, finding those practices that can help calm your mind. Cause this is not easy and it's not easy work, especially when those thoughts get into your head and you feel personally responsible for them. And it's hard to persuade ourselves. And this is the Brene Brown in me. Uh, it's hard to persuade that we're good enough, that we're doing all we can do. And that these are problems that take collectives to solve.
and it's not up to any just one person. Absolutely, great advice, absolutely. Um, do we have any questions? If I'm missing it in the chat, please retype them. Paul and Steve, oh, my cat's joining the conversation. <laughs> Uh, we've got one. How do we deal with the denial of others about these horrors? Um, good question. You know, there's a lot of people who look at me and say, why wolves and why do you care? And that doesn't really happen. And mm -hmm. So let me ask you, what do you say? How do you respond to people when they ask you, why the wolves? Well, I know, Paul and Steve, do you want to chime in? Um, mm -hmm. I always talk about the hum the human connection. Our tagline is when we save wolves and save ourselves, and that it is about humanity overall. In my opinion, these crimes against animals are crimes against humanity. We're all connected. I'll let my cohorts jump in here. What do you want to say? Anything? You, did. <laughs> you go. I, I wasn't ready for I know, I'm not quite ready. Were. You know, okay. it's funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she said that she had a question. No, no, we're talking about what do you say yeah. uh, to people yeah. who, uh, I don't know. I, I find it really hard and, and it's a struggle. And I find most of the time I try and I'm not heard. So I don't, I don't really have, you know. And then it has to be okay to walk away, right? Yeah. 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 Getting back to what she said about, I did good enough here. I can't write, I mean, there's nothing else I can do here. So why waste my? Yeah, there are, there are some people that we're never going to convince. Um, it's almost like a religious belief. And I think the one thing that we have found with, with some of the people that completely do not agree with us on the wolf thing is to try and find something that you have in common. Um, we all have something in common, right? And I think my answer to that question would be start there and, and maybe you can build on that. You know, um, we, we went, the first time we met Carter, we were up in Oregon at a, a working circle meeting in a very small town of ranchers. And we tried to sneak into the back of this little library that had less books than we have in our house. I mean, like 300 people live in this town and, and we did not blend at all. Um, we thought we might, we put on plaid shirts, you know. Um, anyway, point being, um, we sat in the back and we were terrified because these people really did not like wolves and we knew they would not like us. Um, by the time we left, we were swapping, uh, was it cookie, 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 cookie recipes, recipes yeah. with one of the ranchers and although we didn't, you know, understand each other's beliefs on wolves and the fears, and we were completely the opposite. There was a connection there. And I think, I think that's, that's, you can't change someone's religious beliefs, mm -hmm. but you can connect with them in a, in a way that you can be human, you know? And I think that's the best you can do. There are some people you just have to walk away from. And there are some people that are just not informed, um, we were actually talking to Navy SEALs the other day uh, at a presentation and one of them had a lot of friends in Montana that killed wolves and he came up with a whole bunch of stuff that wasn't factual and was very open to hearing facts. So mm -hmm. it really depends on the person, I think. That's great. Yeah, the one thing Betsy said to me when we first, you know, I asked her, why the wolves? And you had this wonderful way of just saying they're part of this chain of humanity. They're part of a chain of existence that we all depend on. And when you interrupt that chain, in some way, there are incalculable, you know, second and third order effects of interrupting that chain of nature. And I was just like, that's so captured me and, and started me. I was like, of course, I'm going to come, you know, want to talk with you. But yeah, finding those things. And I think the point of it is, is from what you just all said, there are so many different ways of engaging or disengaging if you need to. Trust me, when people found out, find out that I work for the CIA and I worked in counterterrorism, you know exactly what they think about. And then that sometimes will extend to what they think of me. And so finding those strategies to engage, find that you know, personal connection, say, you know, let's not talk about this. You know, it was important work at that time for national security. There are things, you know, whatever else I would say to that. 
Um, but it's finding what it's finding your way and it's finding your voice is the most important thing because the worst thing is like when you, when you walk away and you feel like, Oh, should, you know, I should have done this or I should have done that. Whenever you find yourself thinking I should have, please stop yourself. You do what is right in the moment, what you think you need to do for yourself, for your cause, for your safety, um, for the population. So just remember that. Mm -hmm. That's really great advice. Absolutely. I like what you said about staying connected to Patty and, um, this has come up in our other conversations yeah. with all the virtual world that we're in today, you would think it's actually easier to stay connected because now I can, you know, I don't have to worry about driving to California to see Paul and Steve. I see them yep. they're on zoom almost daily, but it's not the same, is it? Because, and a, a lot of times it just becomes this transaction of communication. Yeah. Right. And we tend to do that a lot in our rescue and advocacy work because right now we got it going, you know, action alerts, contact, you know, wolves mm -hmm. are dying. And we have to remember that that connection is different than that connection. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to talk to each other and just laugh and not make everything about the business at hand. So mm -hmm. I believe the four of us, my husband won't get on camera. He's very shy, <laughs> but I believe the four of us always try to engage with each other um, in a completely non-advocacy way over wine and Zoom or something like that because it's so important that I feel has strengthened our relationship to continue to have the resilience to do things like we do today. And so I encourage all of you out there as advocates to please please do that and incorporate it into your uh, work. Um, and I don't want to dominate the conversation, but there's another thing you always say too that I really love is, you know, people look to leaders and how they react to situations. And I would argue everyone on this Zoom call is a leader in advocacy, right? Because you're here today mm -hmm. hearing this information and you're gonna take it to your organizations or your constituents or your legislators or your fans or your friends or your family. And so it's really important that what we put out, right? You can be forceful and you can be warrior, you can be all that, but be that leader with that resilience and that endurance. Yeah, it's, uh, it is a great point, Betsy, and thank you for reminding me of it. Um, but the emotions of a leader is contagious. Um, the work that I do in organizations um, a lot and I'm with the leaders in organizations, um, the behavioral scientists say that up to 75% of what people think of an organization, of their place in it, of whether they wanna support it or not, or remain in it, all come down to their perceptions of the actions of one person, and that's the leader, or their perception of who the leader is. And uh, because we as humans, given how we have evolved, um, emotion is really contagious. How many times have you walked into a room and you were really, really not in a good mood and the persons you were engaging with were upbeat and before you knew it, you had a smile on your face. That's what we're talking about. So Betsy, you're absolutely right that, you know, so our ability, you know, um, to really control our stress is absolutely paramount to our, you know, to kind of how do we make those connections with people and how do we engage with them? And I'm not saying it's easy, but, you know, but, you know, if people know how you're going to show up and know that you're going to consistently show up in a certain way that, that will engage with them. I can tell you, it takes a lot of, you know, emotion and stress out of the room because they're not worried about which Patty's going to show up. <laughs> Patty that is, you know, all, you know, stressed and, you know, screwed into the ceiling or the person who's coming in and ready to engage. So, yeah, I agree. You know, one of the things that I have the hardest time with is um, the feeling guilty for laughing or feeling guilty for being happy because, you know, I know what's going on and I'm spending so much time focused on it that, um, you know, I, I, might, I might be invited to go and hang out with friends and I would choose not to because I just, I don't feel like I should go and have fun. And I'm just wondering, because I'm hearing what you're saying and hearing that 
well, you should, you know, you need to laugh, you need to have fun, but how do you cross that threshold from that guilt? You know, mm-hmm. I think there was somebody in here who said that they were actually early on that they said they were, um, and let me go back to the early president who actually worked national bird. Yeah. Uh, national board certified health and wellness coach. Um, I'd love to hear, um, that person, if you want to, you know, pop in, um, on how you deal with that guilt. I know how I deal with it. Um, it really comes down to knowing I am enough, knowing that I need to take care of myself too. And yeah, there are times where I feel tremendously guilty that I didn't call my mom today. I didn't do this, but there are times where I know that this is, you know, I need to take care of myself. I need to do a little bit of self-nurturing um, or I need to connect elsewhere in order to keep myself going so that I can then keep help keep her going. She's 94, you know, in a pandemic. So there, you know, um, those are my strategies. And I think it's coming to terms in your own mind. Um, where, where's you in this? Because you can't be as effective if you're working all the time on behalf of something and you don't take that step back. Mm-hmm. Because when you take that, I think I mentioned that earlier, is when you take that step back, usually that's where our most brilliant ideas come from. That walk mm-hmm. in the woods, getting together with friends. When all of a sudden your mind is beyond the what is of work, all of a sudden you're into the what if of play. Or the, what if I'm going to run into this person, you know, uh, when we go out to dinner or something, or we get together with friends on Zoom. And so I think it's, it's just remembering and reminding yourself. That book, Time Off, is fantastic. And it may be really great. I'm going to see if that person weighed in. Um, let's see. Okay. At Stanford, there was a Stanford, Stanford Forgiveness Project. Um, through which devastated di- different individuals met and sustained conversations. Um, but it was really a help to, you know, that is, I love that idea of self-forgiveness and how to forgive others. Anyway, I don't know if I answered your question very well, but. Yes, you did. Yeah, yeah that was very helpful. <clears throat> I think it's a matter too, Paula, um, you know, if we don't laugh and let the, and have that as an outlet, yeah. right, then all we will do is internalize and, and, you know, we've all been there. I'm not, I'm not preaching to any choir here and I'm certainly not looking down off a high horse. I mean, I, there's many times where I have, we've had really particularly rough days in advocacy and rescue. And we, at the end of the day, when I laugh, I'm like, gosh, how can I do that after I just came out of something so awful? But then I realize it's absolutely necessary so I can get up tomorrow and deal with that awful situation. So, and some of us, Patty, too, I, um, as I mentioned to you before, uh, in our advocacy work, not me particularly, but others, and certainly Steve, if he's willing to speak to it, have been, have been threatened, yeah. or have had their lives threatened, um, death threats, um, um, killed animals placed on their doorsteps um you know being an advocate you know it's crazy right first of all this insanity to try and kill wolves as many as possible anytime anywhere but then to actually threaten the people who are trying to be a voice for them um i'm not quite sure how some of you deal with that steve i don't know if you want to speak to that at all but that's a pretty big it's, it's a pre- becoming more prevalent yeah, I mean, it it took me uh, a while <laughs> to get used to it, to get over it at first, and then to get used to it. I mean, I, I put myself in a position that was, you know, definitely was not expecting to, well, I guess I was expecting to be in that con- position because we did take an armed guard with us um, into the backwoods of Montana many years ago. Um, but realistically, I didn't in my mind at the time, didn't think that I was going into something that was that dangerous. I thought that was a precaution. Mm -hmm. Um, It turned out that it was a very valuable precaution that probably wouldn't have come back. Um, And that was poking my nose in places where I didn't realize there was so much anger and hatred, which has really spurred what we do now. Um, It's, 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 it's scary. Um, I don't know if you ever get over it. It makes you feel like 
a little more aware of things, um, I think, and a little more aware of um, what you do and what you say and how to say it and how to do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people, I know some of the panelists um, that have gone through the same thing. A lot of times it's just talk, but in this day and age, you just never know. So I think it's really just about being aware and know that if you are being threatened, you're actually doing something important, I think, um, because they're feeling threatened by what you're doing. And so you're obviously hitting a nerve. I don't know. I think you just become more aware. Mm -hmm. But how did you, how did you handle it? How did you keep your resilience? Cause when he got back, I mean, there were, he had some, some PTS for a while, like he would be fine. And then all of a sudden he would have a moment, you know, where he become overcome by what he experienced because it was pretty shocking I mean it's, it's knowing it's one thing is knowing something one thing is then experiencing it I think are two different things so what was it that kept you resilient it actually made me stronger to be honest with you it actually made me want to push more um in, in a sense and you know of course I have my you know, Kim Beam right here my, my little protector is out in Montana, Mark Cook and Casey York and everybody supporting me. And, <laughs> and they're the ones, you know, I, and that's why I said at the beginning of my speech, a, a lot of the speakers today, you know, we're in California. Um, and if I hadn't gone out there and faced these people face to face, I would never have known what a lot of these people are going through right now. Um, but, you know, and Betsy has been through it too. I mean, you've been dealing with these people in Arizona, we don't deal with them quite as much in California as, as a lot of the panelists have. Um, maybe that's a question for them because I know these people do it daily. You know, they're all my heroes because we understand now what they go through, you know? So it, it's about being supported by other people. It's about being surrounded by, you know, the people that care about you. And it's about all of us, you know, sticking together and watching each other's backs. I think, I think that's how we, we get through it. I love what you just said. Some of those themes really resonated with me, you know, from my time in environments that are very analogous, you know, being prepared of having your backup systems, of uh, knowing what you're gonna need to do on the flip side to take care of yourself, to decompress. And to get back to um, your earlier question, about you know handling the guilt, and there's a little bit of this too. Um, Sabrina, who is the uh, the person who is the the coach in the field that I think is really very interesting and cool. Um, it's a question of my identity. I bring love to myself, so self love, um, self care, um, in many forms. One of which is love and laughter with others, mm -hmm. and you know that allows me, you know, allows her obviously to work through that period of you know, why am I not doing more? Because she knows that she needs to love herself and take care of herself and allowing others to love on me and absorb it. So thank you. I love that thought, which is a and wonderful also, way to end choosing it. not to be a martyr, you yeah. know, but yeah. living yeah. in your strength, mm -hmm. which is really helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Maybe that's an excellent point to end on as we come up on 245. Um, thank you. <laughs> Patty, uh, just amazing as always. Um, I, thank you very, very much. And as you can see, there were so many parallels in what you have gone through in your life and what we go through as advocates. So mm -hmm. I greatly appreciate it. I hope the audience um, received the same benefit out of this. Uh, the worksheet is in those documents in the folders and we'll continue to post the link. Um, and we're gonna take a 15 minute break before we kick in with the uh, West Coast, I believe is up next. Yep. And uh, much more to come. So thank you so much, Patty. And, thank you uh, very much. Thank you. Patty, thank you. Such a pleasure meeting you. Thank you. Good luck with all that you do and thank you. <laughs>